Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tech Tune Up. I'm Paul Meeks, your host, in conjunction with my friends at Benzinga. I'm on this broadcast today from Charleston, South Carolina. And of course, uh, Benzinga is headquartered in my home state in the city of brotherly love, not brotherly love, the Motor City, Detroit, Michigan. So what I want to do, uh, as I always do, is try to give you some real concrete tech ideas, individual stocks and tech trends in which you can make money, right? I'm not beholden to any investment bank. I'm not beholden to a money management firm that's going to be talking only uh, very positively about the stocks that they hold or negatively if they are short some names, completely unattached completely unfiltered. I'm a pretty popular tech investment commentator, maybe not necessarily for the knowledge that I have that's better than everybody else, but the fact that I go contrarian, I tell it how I see it, again, not conflicted in any way. I've been covering this tech sector almost exclusively since I got out of grad school in 1992, and probably my claim to fame, late 90s, early 2000s, when I worked at Merrill Lynch Investment Managers, which is now part of BlackRock, I created, launched, and managed at that time the world's largest technology funds franchise. So that's the uh, background. Oh, and by the way, I'm also here in Charleston, South Carolina, a finance and accounting professor at the Citadel. So that's a little bit unique. But anyway, let's get to the uh, task at hand. Let's talk about some of the key tech stocks that were in the news last week. So first of all, we have uh, Palantir. You know, Palantir is everybody's uh, favorite spy company. And Palantir had what appeared on the surface to be a nice positive quarterly surprise. The stock reacted in kind. It went way up. But the story of Palantir and the reason I don't like the stock and I'd probably sell into the strength is, is it's two businesses. One is its um, mainstay government business. Their first contract was with the CIA. And then they followed on with a commercial business, which is getting a little bit of an artificial intelligence uh, boom. But the problem is it's still relatively small. And I don't think when you put it all in that Palantir deserves this kind of markup. It's probably going to grow over time, maybe 15 if they're lucky, uh, 20 percent. But I don't think that's sustainable. And unfortunately, in this company's history, which isn't that long as a publicly traded company, their results are always helter skelter. Sometimes they beat uh, quarters big like they did this past week, and sometimes they badly miss. I do not trust these guys. And I also never trust when uh, CEOs and CFOs on these uh, quarterly conference calls are super promotional. And here is a direct quote from the conference call from CEO Alex Karp of Palantir. He called the commercial business performance within the quarter bombastic, baller, and incomprehensibly good. This is a grown man calling the company's uh, business baller. I don't know. I guess that's kind of cool, but I'm worried about uh, the overpromotion here. I think this stock is up on way too much uh, hype. I'm a uh, better seller. And as I go through these stocks here, take a look at the information we have from Benzinga Pro, which I recommend. I'm a subscriber. A lot of cool tools to help you do your work. So the next one is Snap. This is the uh, company with Snapchat. And I also would like to say in uh, conjunction with Snapchat is the company Pinterest. These are two social media platforms on the fringes. The dominant social media platforms forevermore will be Google and Meta. And so both of these companies had atrocious results. Doesn't surprise me. I would never own these stocks because in digital advertising, you need to show the advertisers that you have the eyeballs. And if you have all the eyeballs at Google and Meta, why do you go to these other guys? Anyway, I think that uh, anyone who is going to play the stocks on the digital advertising fringe like uh, Snapchat and Pinterest, only do it for a trade. Just go back with the big boys. And of course, the third player over time, not just in the U.S., but abroad, that's going to be a major player in digital advertising is Amazon. Amazon now 
has a very large advertising business embedded in all the other stuff. So stay away from the fringe. The strong get stronger, particularly in digital advertising. The next is uh, Uber. I own this stock. They had a pretty good quarter last week. You know, one of the problems with uh, Uber and also with Lyft, for a long time, they've had what I call profitless prosperity, which means they have rapid revenue growth, but they never drop any of it down to the bottom line for profits. So Uber has distinguished itself with its most recent report that it finally put together last year, its first year of profitability. The stock has come a long way. I've been really good on this one, but it might be a little expensive, but I also wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it. And I would be prepared if it had any dip to buy it because I think we've had a nice profit inflection with Uber, though I think Uber's number one. Lyft is always going to be a, a distant number two, so stay away from Lyft. The next stock on my list is kind of interesting. Uh, at least it might be interesting you that I even mention it's Ford, the auto company. One of the things I thought was really telling this week, which was a horrible sign, is Ford announced with its results that it is really paring back its uh, spending and other resources on its uh, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, there was so much hope for that industry a couple of years ago. Of course, it was brought to the dance by Tesla. Uh, they did well for a very long, long time. Right now, I think this, the stock Tesla is a better short because that stock has imploded and probably continues to face pressure. But one of the major companies like a Ford, like a General Motors, like some of the other major auto companies abroad, they're making announcements that it's not so fast with EV. The company is telling us that they want to double down, refocus on their legacy auto business. And so unfortunately, the EV, the EV business will continue to grow, but it's going to grow at a much slower rate. And when it grows at a much slower rate for a period of time, it's going to squeeze operating margins and those stocks will come down. I will tell you this. If you believe in electric vehicles, if you believe in what we call ESG investing, that is E is uh, environment, C S is social, G is governance, embrace those themes in your personal life. Embrace those themes in your business life. Do not embrace those themes in your investing life because almost all of them have been miserable investments despite the fact that they originally wanted to do good. Uh, the next uh, piece of the puzzle I want to talk about is the companies that sell their chips, semiconductor companies, into the auto industry. We've had a couple of majors report recently. Uh, one is NXPI. The next one is Microchip. Then there's a European company called Infineon. This is very important because chips going into autos, if that is robust or if it's weak, tells us a little bit about the economy. It would be the ultimate economic tell. And unfortunately, from most of these companies, they are reporting very poor results for the lack of demand by the major auto companies for their chips. So this is one part of semiconductor land. I like other parts of semiconductors very much, but I do not like these, what they call analog chips, microcontrollers, which are mostly sold into the auto industry. I wanted to follow up next on my report of uh, Meta, you know, AKA the old Facebook. Last week I reported about how wonderful it was and I still think the stock, even though it's soared, is going higher. They've had a couple of good quarterly reports, positive quarterly reports, and I believe in the cockroach theory, which means when you see one roach, there's more, which means on a positive note, when you have one positive quarter surprise, there's more. When you have one negative quarterly surprise, there's usually more, but this is a very positive in favor of Meta. But this is one of the things that lingers from last week that really bothers me. I love Meta's fundamentals, think the stock's going much higher. I own it. I'd be tempted to buy more. But here's the deal. A lot of uh, folks have been blessing Meta, not for those obvious reasons, but the fact that the company is going to start to pay a dividend. Let me tell you this, in my long period of covering tech stocks, when a tech company pays a dividend, I think that's a red flag. They are telling you that they have excess cash that they'll give back to shareholders instead of investing in some new innovation. I don't want to see my fast growth tech companies paying dividends. And even if you wanted to buy Meta for its dividend, 
its dividend yield is 0.4%. If you wanted uh, income, why wouldn't you just buy a 30-day U.S. Treasury bill and make an annualized 5.4%? It's ridiculous. Do never, never, ever buy tech companies because they pay dividends. When a tech company like uh, years ago, IBM, uh, Cisco, Intel, when they started paying dividends, they told you that their rapid growth was over. And the only reason we invest in tech companies is for rapid growth. So dividend paying tech companies, bad, definitely not good. Um, The last one is Alibaba. Alibaba did one of the biggest American IPOs of all time back in uh, 2014. Alibaba, if you know, is essentially the Amazon of China. And I was really uh, positive on these Chinese internet stocks, made a lot of money with them years ago. And I was really positive when we all came out of COVID that there would be a big return in some of these names. It just hasn't happened. And here's the deal. Alibaba had another disastrous quarter. And with my cockroach theory, there will be more disastrous quarters coming, most likely. In the meantime, the stock's cheap, but I don't buy it because what happens with the Chinese tech stocks is the government totally controls them. At any time, the Chinese government could go to any of these companies, regardless of how successful, and essentially clamp down on their business model and take their companies to zero. How can we possibly invest in that environment? I don't think you can buy... Um, Chinese tech companies, Chinese internet companies, no matter how attractive they look. So now I'm going to uh, delve into, you know, some of my favorites. So here's my list of favorites. Of course, it would be insane to change this uh, uh, list uh, too often. But, you know, these are the ones that if you're a tech investor, I think they're better buys. And it is a sometimes contrarian list with what you'll see um, on Wall Street. And um, it's also going to be much more focused. So, yes, I continue to like uh, Amazon. The company has reported. I look for acceleration in the next couple of quarters. And they're all important and most profitable business. Amazon Web Services, AWS, that is the tell. I like ASM Lithography, which is a company that's actually headquartered in the Netherlands as the leading semiconductor capital equipment company with the key technology, and only they have it, in what we call EUV, extreme ultraviolet. Next, I like it out of all the cybersecurity plays, because I do think it's a reasonable theme. The most I like is CrowdStrike. A lot of people like Palo Alto Networks. I prefer CrowdStrike. Of course, I continue to be on the Alphabet or Google bandwagon. Digital advertising will continue to be robust for them, particularly in a U.S. presidential election cycle. And I think at the end of the day, even though right now Microsoft is getting more artificial intelligence PR, at the end of the day, Google will be right with them. They will be a major player in the AI market in whatever shape it takes. Next, I like my South American Amazon equivalent, Mercado Libre, ticker symbol E-M-E-L-I. Stock has done great. think it's going higher. I love uh, Microsoft. I still think there's some upside there. I really like the growth of their own cloud infrastructure business that competes with Amazon. It's called Azure. And I really do think this 49% stake that they hold in OpenAI will continue to propel them forward. Until further notice, they will be America's AI leader with apps, whereas NVIDIA, the semiconductor maker, will lead in AI infrastructure. I like ServiceNow. ServiceNow is a group of software companies that we call ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning. They essentially provide things like HR support, payroll support, inventory tracking for enterprises. I think uh, ServiceNow is the best of the group. That would include others like Oracle, a much bigger cap name, and maybe even Workday. Believe it or not, you guys, I continue, even after it tripled in 2023, to like NVIDIA. Here is an interesting tell. Wall Street expects next year. Now, next year for NVIDIA is a year that ends January 31st of 25. They're on a January fiscal year, but it's pretty close to what we would consider calendar 2024. 
The estimate on the street for the revenues is $94 billion. Meta or Facebook in their quarter just announced a week ago said that they're going to up their capital expenditures. Most of it is going to be spent on these NVIDIA chips. They're going to spend, this is one company, one customer of NVIDIA's, 30 to 37 billion. And even if they don't spend all of that on NVIDIA's AI-centric chips, that is a big dollop from a huge and important customer. And if the other big cloud players do the same thing, like an Amazon and a Microsoft, NVIDIA won't have $94 billion in revenues next year. It'll be much, much more. And when that becomes a reality, which I think it will be, that stock's going even much, much higher. The last one is a company called Super Micro, which is kind of interesting. It makes customized servers that find their way into AI data centers, a much smaller cap. I've been uh, really good with this one. And I think it's going further, much higher because like NVIDIA, it's supplying AI infrastructure. And AI infrastructure so is what's going on now. I don't expect AI apps to be a material contributor to anybody's earnings for another year or so. So those are my uh, favorite tech stocks. And now I want to delve into some of the key tech trends. So... Here's some stuff that's interesting. Microsoft, I'm not going to uh, delve deeply into the Microsoft story. You've heard it several times from me and everybody else, but this is interesting. This is the 10th anniversary of Satya Nadella becoming Microsoft's CEO. And he was a relatively obscure executive at Microsoft. He was not the leading candidate to be CEO. I think they may have even asked some other people that might have said no but what he does is he comes in and reorients this PC company onto a cloud, created that Azure cloud infrastructure, and the stock has done fabulously from 2014 when he changed the strategy. And that was kind of a slow growth, very boring, mature company at that time to what it is today. Not just a leader in the cloud, the leader in AI. And it goes to show you that if you are going to be successful in tech, yes, you have to have leadership skills, right? You have to have some charisma, be able to talk to all the different constituents, but you have to have a tech vision. And for the prior decade or so before Satya Nadella comes in in 2014, Stephen Bomber is the uh, CEO and he was a bombastic guy. He was probably the ultimate salesman, but man, under his watch, that company missed several key tech trends. Right. They missed the uh, Internet in the late 90s. They came late and then they missed the wireless boom a few years later. But now not only did they catch the cloud and AI wave, they let it. Boy, this guy, Satya Nadella, they couldn't pay him enough. So anyway, just celebrating his decade in charge. Next thing I want to talk about, which is a little bit against the grain, is uh, I'm really worried about the AI hype. It is going to be a big deal. Of course, it's going to be a big deal. But what has happened is I believe the money to be made last year for sure, this year, and maybe the year after, is not with anybody who offers a AI product, maybe a software app, but the folks that are building the infrastructure. So it's game over right now for people like NVIDIA and Supermicro, two names on the uh, Meek's favorites. So I would be wary because I've uh, been to this dance before about too much hype too soon in AI, not for the building of AI, the plumbing will continue, but for any kind of success with the products, right? Everyone knows that sooner or later, AI will be ubiquitous. Every product will have it embedded. Now, if that's the case, that's cool, but uh, we could be in a situation, everybody has it. And the only way you distinguish your company is by not having it, and that means it's a commodity product. And that means while it's very cool and it does bring uh, productivity to customers, I don't know if AI is going to be a moneymaker. Right now it's being priced like it's going to be a huge moneymaker. I think it might be a moneymaker for the guys that help build the infrastructure. Then it's TBD. And I'm worried about the TBD part. And so be very careful. It's the same thing that happened in the internet. So at that time, I'm running one of uh, the world's largest tech funds. 
And if you were in the late 90s and you just attached .com to your name, even if you weren't a tech company, the stock would go through the roof. And then the internet did become a big deal, right? I mean, think about the uh, world today if we didn't have the internet. Yes, as advertised, maybe bigger than as advertised. But while some companies did very well with it, and it created some mega cap companies like uh, Meta and Alphabet and Amazon, most of those dot-com companies went to zero. I think the same thing will happen here. I want to see if two important products gain traction this year to prove that there is some AI money to be made. First of all, it's Copilot, which is being offered by Microsoft. Will people buy it? And then just last week, uh, Google announced Gemini, which is going to be their own chatbot. But the interesting thing about this chatbot is they're going to charge people for it. Will you buy it? If you don't buy Gemini, and if Microsoft doesn't sell successfully a hell of a lot of Copilot subscriptions, I'm worried that the AI uh, bloom will be off that rose. So anyway, uh, the next thing is a big deal last week in media. Some people are saying, let's power back into Disney, right? They had a pretty good quarter. Of course, the only reason they had a good quarter is they fired everybody in sight. You are not a good company if you have the only source of earnings is cutting expenses and you're not growing your top line. So Disney has a, I thought, a rather unremarkable quarter. It shows that their legacy linear television business is in a serious uh, tailspin. And um, they announced a deal with Warner Brothers and others in which they're going to combine their sports related properties, including ESPN, you know, uh, Disney owns ABC and ESPN, and they're going to continue what uh, they call a skinny bundle. And so you can uh, consume your sports that way, you know, direct to consumer video streaming. And then uh, Disney also said separately, they are going to have their own standalone direct to consumer video streaming app for ESPN, but they're not going to announce that or actually uh, they did announce it, but not um, promote it until the fall of 25. You guys, if you ever want to buy a video streaming company, just hold your nose and buy more Netflix. Because all these other companies, while they might have some uh, cool properties, they might have some nice brands, they are tragically flawed linear television focused companies that are dying and they're scrambling to become video streamers to make up for the crap. And so that is going to be a difficult transition, right? To go from an old school media company to essentially what is a tech company. I don't think Bob Iger at uh, Disney or any of these other guys are going to pull it off. I would dump any of those stocks on a rally and just buy some more goddamn Netflix video streaming game over. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is the Fed. The Fed is our central bank, Federal Reserve Board. And one of the things I'm worried about, I'm not worried about if, uh, you know, AI infrastructure spending starts to dwindle for NVIDIA to worry about its stock price. What I'm worried about for not just tech, but any of these aggressive growth stocks is for their valuations to remain elevated, for these stocks to continue their bull rallies. You have to have, at some point, the Fed turn the uh, tide on monetary policy and start to lower interest rates, right? They've been raising interest rates for the better part of two years. And right now, the market is expecting the Fed to lower interest rates by one quarter percent each time, five different times in 2024. And they expect that the first cut could come as soon as March. We're already in February. So I will tell you this, it looks like the Fed will cut rates this year two, maybe three times max, and it won't be in March. Maybe the first cut is May, maybe if it's later in the year. And when that becomes uh, common knowledge, unfortunately, that becomes a real problem for the valuation of tech stocks. And it has nothing to do with AI or any other trends. It's all about monetary policy. And even though I don't uh, fancy myself an economist, I do know that that variable, that driver is as important as any others. Let me just uh, talk about a few things before we uh, wrap up. One of the things that also worries me a little bit, 
and I think gives us an opportunity for tech stock picking this year. I think we'll see a real bifurcation, which means there'll be some tech companies that will continue to dominate and they will be some other tech companies that will really falter because we just got through primarily all the tech earnings and some had positive earnings surprise, even though expectations were uh, already pretty high, then some really blew it. And I highlighted some of those like uh, Pinterest and Snap last week. But another tell is that all is not well in the tech sector is since the beginning of 23, we have fired in our sector 300,000 people, about 30 or 40,000 people just since the beginning of 2024. And are these companies that are rationalizing their costs at long last because maybe they got too fat? Could be, could be, but also they're probably giving us a signal with these mass firings that they're expecting some sort of revenue uh, deceleration. And the only way they can maintain their profit margins is to also cut costs at the same pace. So consider that. I don't think it's all uh, good news, and I'm going to try to pick the right ones for you. And the last thing I thought was kind of cool is uh, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk company. It has a satellite uh, web service called Starlink, and uh, it came to uh, some fame when they started to serve the Ukrainian troops during the beginning of that war, right? Giving them some valuable satellite internet intel. Well, they just announced that they signed a deal where they're going to be offering uh, Starlink Wi-Fi on Hawaiian Airlines. I know it's just uh, one customer and Hawaiian Airlines isn't one of the marquee U.S. Uh, airline companies. But on the other hand, if uh, they do that, it could be a inflection point for the Starlink service, which is a big part of uh, SpaceX, which is now a private company. But I'm sure Elon Musk and company believe that it should be going public before too long. But watch for other Starlight uh, satellite Wi-Fi service uh, customer sign-ons. Could be a trend of something quite interesting. So, Nate, that's what you have it. I'm here from my uh, dojo in Charleston, South Carolina. I will look forward to seeing you uh, next week, Friday at 2 o'clock Eastern. If you think this stuff is cool, um, reach out to me. If you don't think it's great, give me some uh, constructive feedback. But please um, like the show. Subscribe to our channel. Write me a comment. Good, bad, or indifferent. And also consider Benzinga because as we saw in this presentation today, uh, we all should be levering some of these uh, Benzinga Pro Tools. I definitely do. I think it's definitely worthwhile. And I've been around a long time, so I should know. Anyway, you guys, uh, we will see you uh, next week. Stay tuned.